Es que ya está a grabar, René. Sí, adelante. Ok. Hello everyone, welcome to this new ACLO Chua Colloquium. Uh, it's our pleasure to, today to have with us Dr. Cristina Ramos Almeida from the Institute of Astrophysica de Canarias. She will be talking about optical nuclei and she will be properly introduced by Isabel Marquez, the head of our ACLO Chua project. Hello everybody, good morning. Thank you very much for being here for uh, another colloquium from the, from the new ACLO Chua program at the Instituto de Astrophysica de Andalucía. And thank you, Cristina, for having accepted our invitation. It's a pleasure for us to, to have her here. Uh, Dr. Cristina Ramos Almeida, uh, Almeida is a staff scientist at the Instituto Astrofísica de, de Canarias, the IC. She was born in, in Santa Cruz, in, in La Palma, um, in Spain, of course, and, and a well-known reputed island for, having, for hosting cutting-edge instrumentation for astrophysics. Uh, she was... Um, uh, she did her PhD at the, IS, yeah, at the IAC in 2009, and then she moved to the United Kingdom for two years to work as a postdoctoral research associate at the University of uh, Sheffield. And she, then she came back to the IAC in, in 2011 as a research fellow, and then she was awarded uh, with a Marie Curie intra-European uh, and uh, Ramonica Hall fellowships. Her research is about supermassive black holes um, at the centers of massive galaxies. And in particular, she investigates how these supermassive black holes influence the evolution of galaxies, uh, of the galaxies they inhabit. She has published more than 120 works in peer reviewed uh, journals, mostly on the study of the obscuring material around the nuclei of active galactic uh, galaxies and on the triggering and feedback of this nuclear activity. At the IAC, uh, Dr. Ramos is a principal investiga investigator of a research group, Nuclear Activity in Galaxies, which is made up by 15 researchers, including staff, postdoctoral and predoctoral uh, researchers, and master students. Uh, the group includes people from Spain, Italy, Bra uh, Brazil, the United Kingdom, Mexico, and Sweden, so uh, an example of, of international uh, group. She's also a representative uh, of the IEC research line, Formation and Evolution of Galaxies. And today she, is, she, she will be speaking about investigating the impact of quasar feedback on the central kiloparsec of galaxies. And she will show us how, how the group and, and she in particular deals with cutting edge uh, uh, to telescope data and hydrodynamic simulations. Thank you very much again, mm. Christina. You're welcome. Thank you, Samuel, for the nice introduction. And uh, thanks for inviting me to, to give this, uh, this talk. Very happy to, to be here. It's always a pleasure to visit uh, the IAEA and, and Granada, of course. And uh, as uh, Isabel has said, uh, uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, the effect that uh, AGN activity has on galaxy evolution. Uh, the, the results that I will be showing are mainly uh, from the QSOFID uh, project that I'm leading at the IAC, but also some from the uh, GATOS collaboration, uh, whose PI is uh, Almudena Nonserrero. So, because let me start uh, giving a step backwards, uh, because um, this is not a specific AGN audience, uh, at least not all of you. Um, so, I, I ask myself, like, why do we care about uh, studying active galactic nuclei? Why do we care about nuclear activity? Well, I think nuclear activity has a process that is interesting in itself because it tells us a lot about uh, dramatic accretion around supermassive black holes in the center of galaxies. But in the last uh, years, it, it has become particularly popular, uh, something that has benefited our community, uh, because uh, it, seems to be play, it seems to be playing an important role on the way uh, galaxies uh, evolve. And one of the great challenges of the, of the next uh, decade, according to our American colleagues uh, that uh, put together this uh, decadal survey uh, one or two years ago, uh, it's precisely the uh, study unveiling the drivers of uh, galaxy evolution, of galaxy growth. We want to understand how galaxy form, why they have evolved in the way they have uh, done it, and, and, and we see them today as they are. And, and as I said, we believe that one of the basic ingredients that uh, help to drive this evolution is nuclear activity. Uh, actually, in the so these are the the research lines uh, that that uh, in which we divide our our research at the IAC. 
And uh, one of the main goals of our uh, strategic plan for the years uh, between 2020 and 2023 uh, was precisely to, to study the, the physics of active galactic nuclei and supernova feedback and their connection with galaxy evolution from the observational and theoretical point of view. So this is what this talk is about. It's uh, the work that we are doing uh, within our group and also thanks to our uh, collaborators. And uh, now I guess we can focus on uh, active galactic nuclei. Let me say that uh, something that has also changed in the last uh, years is the way we understand active, uh, nuclear activity. In the past, uh, when we talk about AGN, we consider that it, they were a particular type of galaxy known as active galaxies. Uh, but these days, we don't think that uh, AGN are just 10 or 5% or of the galaxies in the local universe, but instead, nuclear activity is just a phase in the that can be as short as 0 0.1 or 1 mega years, according to simulations, for example. Uh, and this um, uh, phase is super short compared with other galaxy processes, as for example, bar formation, bulge formation, or mergers that take giga years. Okay. So um, the AGN is just like a glimpse in the in the life of a, of a galaxy, and actually not only one, but more than one AGN episode might take place in uh, in uh, in the life of a galaxy, depending on whether there is gas to uh, feed the supermassive black hole and trigger the activity. So it might well be the case that uh, we have a, a normal galaxy in which we do not detect any signature of nuclear activity. And eventually, because of a uh, disk instability or a merger, gas is accreted to the center, and then uh, it produces uh, efficient accretion, and then the, the nucleus shines as uh, an AGN. Uh, and it could be the case that all massive galaxies go through these uh, AGN phases. So in order to, to illustrate um, how uh, AGN are triggered and also the impact that they might potentially have on, on the host galaxy, let me show this uh, uh, snapshot video from the TNG-50 simulation. This is a very high resolution uh, cosmological simulation in which we see that at high redshift, there is plenty of gas. Here, what we are seeing is uh, gas velocity in different colors with the white and yellow colors corresponding to the highest velocity gas. So you can see that when there is a supermassive black hole, at some point, uh, the, the accretion may start to be uh, uh, really high. And there is a lot of gas inflowing, but also as a reaction to this accretion, feedback takes place, and then the gas is accelerated and expelled from the supermassive black holes onto the circumgalactic medium. And you can see uh, there is an example here, and there is another one here that receives this influx of gas, and then the material is expelled uh, outside the, of, the, of the galaxy. And this is uh, one of the manifestations of AGN feedback, which is any impact that the AGN has on the galaxy ISM and, and beyond on the circumgalactic medium. It can be gas heating, gas removal, uh, gas disruptor, uh, disruptor, disruptor, sorry, uh, or even metal enrichment, for example. Uh, normally, we, when we study the AGN feedback, we look at, the, at these uh, winds of gas accelerated at very high velocities because it's easier to, to detect them observationally. Uh, but it's not the only way. But as I said, AGN have become very popular, uh, mainly because simulations do not work if they do not include AGN feedback in them. Uh, here we see a luminosity function, and we see, uh, so in blue, uh, these are observations, and these are two models considering and not considering AGN feedback. And basically, all the simulations fail to reproduce the high mass end of the luminosity function if AGN feedback is not taken into account. So what happens is that if in the simulation the AGN is not turned on, then the gas cools down very efficiently, galaxies keep forming stars, and they end up being very star-forming and massive like this one here, and not like this uh, red and, and less massive galaxy like, uh, like this one here. And as far as, as, far as I'm aware, uh, there is no cosmological simulation that manages to reproduce the observations without including uh, AGN feedback. Uh, so, because of this, observationally, we have started a massive search for signatures of this AGN feedback, for example, in the forms of winds, as I was saying, but it's not the only uh, way to look for AGN feedback signatures. And I think it's fair to say that today we have a 
uh, plenty of observational evidence of uh, agent feedback happening on scales that go from tens of parsecs, so from the innermost region of galaxy, for example, in this uh, nice works by Santiago Garcia Burillo, done with ALMA, at very high re angular resolution, but also on, on hundreds of kiloparsec scales. There is this uh, very nice uh, work, for example, uh, done by Ignacio Martin Navarro that they published in Nature. And here they studied the star formation histories of satellite galaxy that are at up to hundreds of kiloparsecs of distance from the supermassive black hole in the center of this galaxy. And what they found, looking at observation, but also simulations, is that depending on the position angle of the satellite galaxy, the star formation history are different. And they interpret this as due to the effect of AGM feedback that happens along a certain direction. And therefore, some of the satellites are more affected than others uh, because of the feedback that is produced by the central supermassive black hole of the central galaxy. So, like I said, here we are seeing like the two uh, uh, two extremes of AGN feedback, no, on very uh, nuclear scales and on very large scales. And this is important. It's important to distinguish between these uh, between scales because it allows us to understand things that have been observed um, uh, uh, with real data. What happens is that uh, one of the problems that we face is that when we compare AGN and control samples of non-active galaxy, looking for differences in, for example, global uh, molecular gas content on, or star formation rate, we do not find uh, less molecular gas or less star formation in the AGN. And this is because we are only looking at the current phase of AGN activity. As I said before, the, the, a, a, each uh, AGN phase is very short. So then the impact that this current phase of AGN activity will have on the host galaxy, it's not possible to see in the global galaxy property. We need to look at the very central region, which has the same dynamical time scale as the current phase of the nuclear activity, which is typically one kiloparsec or, or, or a few kiloparsecs at most. So if we want to track the effect of the current phase of AGN activity, we need high angular resolution studies. And this is what this talk is about. But then if we want to track the, the accumulated effect of previous AGN episodes, which is something that is very well captured by uh, quantities like the black hole mass, for example, then we find uh, effects on, on larger scales or larger time scales, as for example, the scaling relations that, that we know uh, between the, the sigma of the, of the galaxy, the velocity dispersion of the galaxy, and the mass of the supermassive black hole. And this is because of the mass of the supermassive black hole captures the power output of the power output sorry of previous uh, AGN uh, episodes okay so different approaches to the same problem but it's important to consider the special scales and time scales that we are talking about when we want to understand how feedback uh, impacts the host galaxies so uh, in the talk, I'm going to be talking about the innermost region of AGN, first about the parsec scales in low to intermediate luminosity AGN, very briefly. And then uh, I, will, I will change to uh, kiloparsec scale feedbacks, so central uh, one, three kiloparsecs of uh, high luminosity AGN, to show you uh, evidence of how this AGN feedback is coupling with the host galaxy, because we are trying to understand why in some cases it's more efficient than in others and we want to understand how it works. So starting from the, from the very uh, central region, from torus scales, we are talking about a, a tiny region in the center of the galaxy that it's also difficult to study because you have a lot of uh, host galaxy material in front of us. Uh, but this is how the, the um, a very cartoonish view of the, how the torus uh, and innermost regions uh, look like uh, from a review that we published in 2017. So basically the supermassive black hole, accretion disk and corona, then the broad line region clumps at a very high density gas uh, rotating very fastly around the supermassive black hole. And then beyond the sublimation radius, we have the uh, torus clumps, uh, it's, uh, which are typical sizes between one and a few tenths of parsecs, depending on the wavelength that you look at. This is in the equatorial direction, the classical torus, let's say, but in the polar direction, we also have dust that is emitting in the mean infrared and that we need to characterize and that we believe is part of, a, of an outflow. So what, I, what I'm trying to say here is that something that has changed also in, a, in the way we understand the torus, the torus of the unification model that we always know that does the one, type one, type two classification in AGN, it's more than that. 
to me, it has changed from being that, from being just something that uh, changes uh, the, the way we see the spectra of galaxies depending on orientation, to something that it's an it's, it's an structure that is part of the AGN feedback cycle because it's connected with the host galaxy and with the supermassive black hole. It's actually the ultimate host galaxy structure, if you want, that is uh, under the sphere of influence of the supermassive black hole, at, at least its inner part. And like I said, it's connected through gas streamers with the supermassive black hole and with, this, with the host galaxy. So it's uh, sort of the, the in-between uh, structure that, that links uh, the two worlds. No? And uh, this is something that we try to capture in this, uh, in this uh, review. We, we, uh, we, used, uh, we try to put together the information that we had in the infrared and, and from the X-rays to understand, the, um, to understand better the, the, the torus. And something that we wrote is that it's a, a structure that it's very complex, it's dynamic. Uh, it's covering factor depends on the properties of the AGN. Uh, and, and like I said, it's the connection between the supermassive black hole and the, and the host galaxy. We believe based on a results that I will uh, present later that it's an episodic structure that varies in its properties with the, like I said, with the, with the AGN property. And also it's episodic because as the AGN turns off, the, the, the torus also uh, uh, disappears. So part of the reason why we have advanced so much in the study of the torus and why our view of it has changed so much in the last uh, few years is the multi-wavelength uh, perspective. In the same way that with uh, other astronomical objects, we put together information from the optical, infrared, X-rays to try to understand what's going on in these sources. In the in torus studies, uh, the same has happened. And here, for example, I'm showing some results uh, based on infrared observations, X-ray and infrared, and also some millimeter using ALMA. ALMA has been a, a revolution for the, for the study of the torus because it doesn't allow us not only to, it allow us not only to image the torus at a, at a given wavelength, but also to study the, the kinematics of the torus, which is something completely new, thanks to the molecular lines that we can see in the submillimeter and millimeter range. So actually, so I showed before the, the, the sketch of the, of the Toru, but this is a more um, a a refined or, or evolved picture of how we believe the Toru looks like by putting together the, inform the information from the different ranges. So here, so here we have uh, in the near infrared, we would be seeing the, the hottest uh, dust within the torus, the, the dust that is in the innermost uh, la, uh, region of the torus, directly illuminated by the AGN. And this is something that we can see, for example, with gravity in the near infrared. So this would be this part here. Then in the mid infrared, we observe part of the dust that is in the equatorial plane, the classical torus, but also we observe the polar dust that emits in the mid infrared. It's a hollow cone that has to be called hollow in order to see the um, the central engine in type 1 AGN. Uh, then in the, in the um, zoom millimeter, we can uh, use these uh, molecular lines uh, to trace the denser gas. And we see that the bulk of the torus mass is in the equatorial plane. So we still have the classical torus, but on top of that, in some AGN at least, we have this polar component. Uh, and like I said, by putting together all the information, this is the picture that we believe uh, uh, explains better uh, the observational results uh, uh, supported by the modeling that we have these days, all right? So as part of this uh, GATOS collaboration, we are trying to, to prove this structure, to prove that this um, uh, scheme uh, is valid for, for, uh, for AGN, nearby AGN of low to intermediate luminosities. So the GATO sample uh, includes uh, some galaxies. There are only a few galaxies. And for some of them, we know that they have this polar emission in the mid-infrared. Other, other objects uh, do not have it. And we still don't know if, it, if it's not there or, it's, or it is just that we are not able to detect it because it's too faint. I will come back to that. Uh, but for example, in this uh, diagram from Almudena Alonso Herrero's uh, uh, work, one of the first uh, GATOS uh, papers that we published in 2021, you can see uh, the GATOS galaxies that we have observed uh, in the mid infrared and also with ALMA. And uh, here, this uh, code indicates whether we detect or not this uh, polar component, this polar emission in the mid infrared. 
And something that is very great about this diagram is that now we do not only look at the image and, and say whether we detect or not the polar component, but we can start to try to understand why we detect this polar component and in which cases we should detect it according to the models. So these are the model predictions for the uh, where we would expect to see infrared polar outflows. So this means that in, uh, under center uh, circumstances, we should expect to detect uh, polar emission produced by polar outflows that lift uh, the dust in the innermost region. And this happens when you have the right amount of column density, so a certain level of column density that it's not too low and not too high, because if it's too high, you have it too much, uh, you have um, too much material to be lifted up. So then you cannot produce the, uh, the polar wind. Uh, and if it's too low, well, you simply don't have enough material to, to do the same. No? So, and you would end up uh, in a case like, like this one. So according to the predictions from this uh, semi-analytical model, we should detect um, objects with polar outflow in this region of the diagram. And in fact, some of the tall gatos galaxies with polar component are around this uh, area here. Uh, and the galaxy in which we do not detect polar component, which are these uh, dots here, for example, uh, like I said, we still don't know if they if they do have a polar component or not, because they are also the less luminous. So color here, you can see that uh, the more luminous the AGN, the more prevalent the polar component, which is also a requirement of the of the models, because the, the higher the editon ratio or the AGN luminosity, uh, the more likely you are to have these uh, polar uh, winds. Uh, but in the case of the lower luminosity AGN, observing in the ground, in the mid infrared, it's really hard. We are very, uh, the sensitivity is not good. And here is where the James Webb uh, comes uh, to the rescue. And actually, in, uh, as part of this uh, GATO collaboration, we have obtained uh, two proposals, two, we, we, we had uh, two proposals accepted in cycle one. One to obtain uh, with MIRI, both, both of them with MIRI in the mid infrared. One of them to observe uh, the gut of galaxy with polar dust uh, in imaging using five filters in order to characterize the, the temperature and the properties of this uh, polar dust. And the other with the MRS, with the IFU mode of MIRI in order to study the, the kinematics of the, of the outflows in uh, using different uh, uh, emission lines. And, and to see if they are co-spatial with the polar outflow that we see uh, in the images in the mid infrared. So this is one of the GATOC targets, NGC 5728, beautiful spiral galaxy. And with MIRI, this is a color combined image, image sorry, using three filters. You can see that it's this uh, very nice uh, star formation, uh, star forming ring in the center of the galaxy. And once we subtract the PSF from the James Webb, which is a hard uh, task to do, uh, then we see the, the polar uh, component that we were expecting to detect because we know it, it was there uh, in the image. And just for comparison, to show you how difficult it is to do this kind of studies from the ground no? and the gain uh, that we have now thanks to the, to the James Webb. So this is the same galaxy observed from the ground here on the left, uh, different filters. And this is uh, like one hour or more of integration in the eight meter, 10 meter telescope. So with the Gemini or, or the GTC. So bare, we barely detect the nucleus of the galaxy. And the James Webb uh, image with this uh, tiny region corresponds to this, uh, only took a few minutes to be done. No? So it's uh, like a new, completely new window opens no? in this uh, kind of study. So showing that even in the local universe, we are gonna learn so much thanks to, to this data because uh, until now we were completely limited no, by, the, by the low sensitivity that we have. And this is just to show you an, an example of the study that we will do with the, with the MRS uh, data. Uh, we have had the first uh, target observed uh, last week. Uh, so we are still precisely NGC, uh, the one that I was showing before, 5728. Uh, so we, we haven't had time to process the data yet, but this is an example of the work that can be done. Uh, this was done by, led by Miguel Pereira Santaella using data uh, from the AGN in the uh, Stefan Quintet, Quintet uh, that was uh, published as part of the, of the commissioning or, or uh, ERS program, I don't remember. Uh, so he took the MRS data 
And uh, we studied the different uh, line kinematics using all the multiple transitions that we have in the mean infrared. And he found um, evidence for the, the jet that this galaxy has uh, impacting the, the material of the host galaxy. This is, these are some dust uh, lanes here in this part of the galaxy. And as the jet impacts this uh, area with higher density of material, uh, it produces enhanced uh, molecular um, uh, line emission and also uh, uh, HF uh, um, and, it, and also ionized uh, emission. So this is the kind of uh, jet gas interaction uh, that we can study in our, also in our GATOS uh, targets. And let me finish this uh, part of the tour by showing the, uh, some of the ALMA results to show you um, uh, this, uh, what I was mentioning before about the torus being something very dynamic, a structure, but it's very dynamic. Uh, this is uh, observations uh, of uh, NGC 1068, the prototypical AGN in the local universe that can be studied with a lot of detail. Uh, this is uh, from uh, Imanishi, uh, 2018. And what you are seeing here is, this is the circumnuclear disk or ring in this case of NGC 1068. Uh, it's like the molecular gas reservoir of the galaxy in the in the central part. This is this has like a diameter of uh, 200 parsecs, and in the center of this uh, disk or ring, this is the torus that was uh, resolved uh, with Alma in uh, cycle two. Uh, and you, what you can see here is that the torus is connected with the CNG, which is a larger uh, structure of molecular gas. This is molecular. This is HCN and HCO plus transition tracing very dense gas in the central region of the AGN. And you can see that they are connected through gas streamers. At the beginning, we thought that it might be an inflow of gas uh, transporting the gas from the CND to the TORU. Mm -hmm. But actually, when we did the kinematic modeling, that Santiago did the kinematic modeling, uh, he found out that it's, it's actually an outflow. It's, it's a material from the TORU that it's outflowing and impacting the, the, sur the inner surface of this ring and actually launching a larger scale outflow that uh, has a, associated a much uh, higher uh, mass outflow rate that has an impact on the, on the host galaxy. So it's like, like a chain of events, you know, like a cascade of events uh, that starts in the innermost region and then affects the galaxy on, on large scales. And we found that the outflow, this, uh, this uh, central outflow that we see here, uh, it um, has a very 3D structure. Like, so the, the bulk of the torus mass, like I said before, it's rotating. It's a bit more than half of the mass. But then there is also a, a substantial part that is outflowing with this uh, very 3D geometry. There, are, uh, there is a component that is almost equatorial. And then there is the polar component that impacts uh, this, uh, this uh, ring. And uh, estimating the time that the, that the torus will uh, last for, considering the AGN accretion rate and the material that it's in the, in the torus, that the one that it's uh, rotating, we estimated that the, the expected lifetime of this structure will be between one and four mega years. And this coincides with the periods of nuclear activity that I was mentioning at the beginning. So it's, uh, if nothing happens, if nothing else happens, if things continue as they are, this is the time for which the, the torus uh, in NGC 1068 would, would uh, last for. And uh, um, so this uh, morphology that we see here, this is again the CND and the torus. What you can see here is that the, this uh, area in between is depleted of molecular gas. We do not see any molecular gas at all. And what we believe is happening is that the, uh, the, the, the AGN feedback in the forms of winds and also the jet that this galaxy has and is contributing to push the, the material outwards is producing this, uh, uh, this uh, peculiar geometry that in the case of NGC 1068 has the right inclination and orientation to, to be observed with this, uh, um, in this uh, privileged way. And we believe that this is what's happening, what's, uh, this is what, what it's explaining, the correlation that Santiago found when he put together the data from NUGA, this is uh, low luminosity AGN, and GATOS, which are more intermediate uh, luminosity agent, cipher like uh, galaxies. No? So you can see that here there, there seems to be a trend. This is the concentration of molecular gas. So objects that are here have the molecular gas more concentrated in the nucleus, so more like balls of molecular gas. And the ones that are here have a, a geometry like this. No? So the gas has been um, pushed uh, outwards, and then we measure a, a higher concentration of molecular gas in the, in the edge of this uh, 200 parsec region. 
And also, coincidentally, well, not coincidentally at all, probably, the, the objects that are here that show uh, this effect uh, more clearly are the ones in which we detect clearly uh, molecular outflows that we can measure and characterize. So it's uh, very likely you know, that this is uh, this uh, depletion of molecular gas in the innermost region is due to the action of uh, AEM feedback. And Santiago is now compiling more data that is available in the archive for more nearby AGN to see if this uh, trend is uh, maintained because here we only have uh, a few a few objects, no? around 20 or maybe a, a little bit less than that. So, but this uh, result, these very nice results, uh, helps me to connect with the with the last part of the of the talk. So this uh, depletion of molecular gas in the innermost region of AGN have been observed in other AGN, in other CIFR galaxies, as the ones that we see in Gatos. Uh, for example, it has been uh, seen in, in NGC 2110, another famous uh, CIFR 2 galaxy, where there is this uh, region devoided of uh, molecular gas. And also they interpret this as due to the action of AEM feedback. And this happens on, on uh, parsec scales, not tens to hundreds of uh, parsecs. But then if we go to higher uh, volumetric luminosity, so quasar like, no, and this connects me, like I said, with the other part of the talk, we also see uh, this uh, effect of uh, the molecular gas being pushed from the nuclear region of AGN due to the, to the effect of uh, AEM feedback. So what we are seeing here is the action of AGN feedback directly impacting the central kiloparsec of galaxies. We might not be able to see the effect on global galaxy scales if we measure the molecular gas mass in the galaxy as a whole in this AGN and compare it with matched galaxy, non-active galaxies, matched in mass and all the properties you can imagine. We will probably not find any difference between them. But if we look at the very center, we see that the AGM feedback is doing something to this, uh, to this gas and also to star formation. Um, so now what we need to quantify is whether this is enough to, to eventually quench star formation in galaxies or not. So with the aim of investigating this in, in a sample of a higher luminosity AGN in, in quasars, uh, we started this uh, piece of feed uh, project at the, at the IEC. We selected the most uh, luminous AGN in the catalog of Reyes, which is a compilation optically selected AGN uh, with narrow lines, more than 800, if I remember correctly. So we selected the, the most uh, luminous uh, AGN in this sample and the most nearby. So we can observe them with very um, uh, good uh, angular resolution with uh, large telescopes. Um, and there are type two quasars. Uh, we, we did this on purpose. Because one of the key aspects of the project is that we, we wanted to study the stellar populations and to do a spectra, uh, to do a stellar population modeling, we need the AGN to be obscured because if you have a direct view of the central engine, then the AGN continuum dilutes everything and it's not possible to study the stellar populations. So this is why we wanted them to be uh, type twos. And also these uh, 48 quasars cover a, a wide range of uh, optical morphology and also they have a, a range of uh, radio power. So we can study if these uh, properties have any influence on, 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 the, on the AGN feedback or vice versa. So this is the, the AGN group at the IAC and this is the, the, part, of the, the part of the team uh, that is working on the QSOP the project. Um, we observe the, the targets with many uh, observ observing facilities around the world, mainly the, the GTC, for example, using EMIR and, and Megara, uh, but also ALMA. Uh, we also have a deep optical imaging obtained with the INT in La Palma. We applied for uh, cycle two data with the James Webb. Uh, and also we have some uh, IFU data in the near infrared from Gemini and uh, Symphony on the VLT. And we also have optical spectroscopy from Sloan for all of them. So uh, as I already mentioned, uh, the, the aim of this uh, project is to characterize the uh, multi-phase outflow properties of the quasar. So we want to study these uh, winds of gas uh, in different uh, phases, molecular, ionized, uh, or molecular, commolecular, et cetera. And then we want to study if these outflow properties have any influence on the galaxy properties that are restricted to the central region of the galaxy, because this is where, where we should look at if we want to uh, characterize the impact of these outflows. 
Uh, and we looked at uh, things like uh, uh, the young stellar populations that have the same uh, ages as the, as the current phase of the gen activity and the outflow that they drive. And also at the, at the innermost uh, morphologies uh, that we can see with ALMA in uh, cold molecular gas. Okay, so let me show you uh, some results of the project. First, I will mention something about the multi phase characterization of the outflow that we are doing. Uh, and then uh, on, the, on the impact of these outflows on the, on the host galaxy properties on nuclear scales. So this, uh, um, regarding the multi-phase characterization of the outflows, this is the part of the PhD uh, project of Giovanna Ferranza at the IAC. Uh, she studied um, uh, some of the quasars for which we have uh, uh, IFU near-infrared observations. Uh, the near-infrared, uh, it's uh, great when you are uh, looking at a local galaxy because uh, it uh, gives you the opportunity to observe at the same time in the same spectrum ionized lines, warm molecular lines, and also very high ionization potential uh, uh, emission lines, like for example, uh, silicon-6, which is a coronal line. Uh, so it, it gives us a lot of emission lines th that we can use to characterize uh, the winds uh, in different outflow phases. So she did the analysis. She, for example, here, uh, she published a study of one of the, of the quasars with uh, very detailed uh, so the, the great thing of IFU is that we can constrain the, the radii, the direction of the outflow, and other properties that with long sleep uh, is more difficult to characterize. Uh, so she did the, the study of this uh, of this uh, quasar, and what it, I, I wanted to highlight this one because it um, it shows you something that we are uh, starting to find in the observation, and is that in the case of the quasar, we ob we observe a very powerful outflow in the ionized uh, phase with a mass of flow rate of uh, 50 solar masses per year, but yes, which is a lot, in, especially in the ionized uh, gas phase. But then in the molecular, in the warm molecular phase, when we look at the warm molecular lines that we also detect in the, in the near infrared, we do not find any signature of, uh, of outflows in the molecular gas phase. And this is not the only case in which uh, we have observed this, no? So this is how the nuclear uh, near infrared spectrum looks like. Of this source, you can see here the, the passion alpha line or the silicon six line that I was mentioning. You know that show this uh, clear uh, broad component, uh, blue shifted. No, this is what we use to characterize the the winds, the outflows. But in the case of the molecular lines, we don't see a signature of uh, molecular outflow at all. There are other galaxies in which we observe the two of them, like for example this one, fifteen zero nine. This is another quasar in our sample, and here you can see that there is a it's quite noisy, but uh, we see the, the, the broad component of the molecular line. So when we started to put together results for different uh, AGN and places, we see that there is a certain proportion of objects in which we detect ionized outflows, but we do not detect the warm molecular outflows. And this is quite puzzling because even in some of them, there are cold molecular outflows that we can see with ALMA, but we do not see them in the near infrared, in the, in the warm phase. So this is telling something about the physics, and this is something that we should study with the with the James Webb because it offers uh, much better sensitivity and and also the the angular resolution. So stay tuned for for more results on that. But in order to we only have a few uh, quasars for which we have measured uh, near infrared uh, outflow properties in the near infrared. Actually, only like four or five quasars have been observed in the near infrared type two quasars. Uh, so now, in order to have a better better statistics of what's going on in the different phases, uh, this is the, what um, Pedro Cesar, a new student at the IAC, is starting to do. We have uh, 100, an hour, 100 hours of uh, a meal time of time in the GTC uh, during these semesters. So we have observed practically the whole of the sample with a meal. And now what we are what he's doing is to, to try to quantify uh, in how many of them we detect ionized outflows, molecular outflows to see um, the statistic in a in a more uh, representative sample of, of quasars. No? So this is what he has just started uh, doing. It. And also Giovanna, as, uh, as uh, part of her PhD, is looking at uh, GTC Megara IFU data of the five of the five quasars that we also have observed uh, with ALMA. So this is one of the quasars, and this is another. So uh, these are seen limited observations. So the first thing that we did was to see if we resolve the, the outflows. And in the case of this one, for example, you can see that it's not resolved. We just see like a blob of uh, high velocity dispersion, meaning that we couldn't resolve the outflow in this, uh, in this galaxy. 
because in general they are very compact. The, the radii that we are measuring is uh, between one and two kiloparsecs. So then if you have a single limited observation at this redshift, 0 0.1, it, you are at the limit of uh, being able to detect them. But in the other four quasars that we observe with Megara, we, we resolve the outflows, no? and we see this, um, um, we, we uh, obtain these uh, uh, kinematic maps that allow us to measure the radii and uh, other outflow properties that uh, we can uh, characterize to quantify um, how these outflows are, uh, how, how uh, relevant they are no? in terms of the mass that they are carrying. And this is a very preliminary result, but uh, Giovanna has uh, done here a comparison of the outflow properties that she measured for these quasars with Megara and the classical uh, Fiore scaling relation. So this is a very well-known paper in the, in the literature uh, where they compile uh, data in the molecular and ionized uh, phase uh, for different types of AGN. And they found that there is a trend with AGN luminosity. So the more luminous the AGN, the more um, massive the outflow, let's say. And uh, what Giovanna found is that the quasars in the ionized phase lie below the, the Fiore uh, relation. And this is because, for example, they assume values for the radius, for the density, and this has a strong impact on the, on the mass of the rate. And uh, by doing a more careful um, analysis of the, of the outflow property, then uh, it's likely that all the data uh, in Fiore will uh, go down quite significantly. You know? So this is something to, to bear in mind. And now switching to the impact that these outflows have on the on the host galaxy. This is a, a work uh, led by my by a postdoctoral researcher in the group, Patricia Bessier. Patricia did like uh, as far as we are aware, like the first uh, uh, resolved uh, stellar population analysis in uh, in one of these quasars uh, to see the the distribution of young stellar populations, uh, intermediate stellar populations, and all stellar population in one of the most uh, nearby quasars in the sample. She used data from Keck, uh, from this instrument, KCWI, which is fantastic for doing a stellar population modeling because it covers uh, this range from 3,500 to uh, 5,600. Now it's even better because they have incorporated the red uh, arm. So now you can observe in a shot from, from 3,500 to 10,000, which is uh, amazing. I think this is the first semester that uh, it's going to be uh, working on Keck. Um, but anyway, this was uh, the range that we needed because we wanted to constrain the, the blue part of the spectrum because we were interested in uh, studying the young stellar populations and also the high order Balmer lines that are in this uh, region of the spectrum. Uh, so Patricia did the modeling uh, or using starlight um, and the bypass models uh, on a spaxel by spaxel basis. And what you are seeing here it's the um, uh, percentage uh, of a uh, young stellar population. A uh, young stellar population we call younger than 100 mega years, which is a population that should be contemporaneous with the AGN activity and the outflow that the, it drives. Uh, so you can see that there is an enhancement of the young stellar population here in this part of the, of the galaxy. Uh, and this is uh, with the same data cube, we can model the oxygen free lines, for example, to see uh, how the outflow uh, is developing in the, in the galaxy. And this is a fantastic uh, scenario to study the interaction between the, the ISM and the outflow, because it's a galaxy that is um, almost phase on, not, not completely phase on, but it's quite phase on. Uh, and the outflow, it's uh, almost coplanar with the galaxy disk. So we see the approaching side and the receding side. So the galaxy would be something like this. And uh, you, we see that the, the part that is uh, of the outflow that is approaching us and the part that is receding. Uh, and what we see is that this enhancement of the young stellar population, it's happening on the region uh, where the outflow is uh, pushing the, the, sorry, the gas uh, in the galaxy and probably favoring, making the conditions of the ISM more favorable to, to uh, enhance star formation. So this would be like a, an example of positive feedback. But on the other side of the galaxy, where the outflow is more turbulent, because here you see the, this is the velocity dispersion, which gives you an idea of how turbulent the, the ionized gas is in different parts of the galaxy. So here the outflow is more turbulent, and it's injecting a higher amount of energy in this part of the galaxy. So then we do not see any evidence for enhancement in, in uh, star formation. So in the same galaxy, I like this study because it shows how complex this problem is. No? In the same galaxy, 
In different regions, we see the completely different effects of the outflow of the agent feedback uh, on, the, on the stellar populations. So we see that on, the, on one side, it's enhancing it, and in the other, it might be preventing it or, or simply not making it favorable for it to happen. No? So when you have, for example, something like the SDSS fiber that covers practically the whole of this, then you have everything mixed and it's practically impossible to tell if in this galaxy AGN feedback is promoting or quenching star formation. So we need this kind of uh, especially resolved studies in order to understand uh, what's going on and how uh, feedback works in, in galaxies. So I'm running out of time. So, um, so let me skip this uh, part because uh, it'll be too much information. So I'm gonna jump uh, to the last one. Uh, this is the, the, the study that we performed with ALMA on the, on the quasars. Uh, we observed seven of them at very good angular resolution because we are interested in looking the, at the central part. Um, uh, we were targeting uh, CO2 to one, which is a very good transition if you want to have a compromise between uh, detectability and uh, uh, tracing the bulk of the molecular gas. Um, so we observed the seven of them that are representative of the morphology that we have in the sample. Uh, they, they more or less have the same stellar masses, which are 10 to the 11 solar masses. Uh, and what we found first was that we did not detect in molecular gas uh, the red uh, early type galaxies. Those have a massive of molecular gas uh, of less than 10 to the 8 solar masses, whereas the others uh, have masses of 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10. So quasars with the same oxygen three volum um, volumetric luminosity, same stellar mass. So regarding AGM properties, they look all the same have completely different uh, molecular gas contents. No? This is something that is um, remarkable, I would say. Uh, but for the five, for the five quasars uh, that we detected in CO2 to one, uh, which are these, uh, these are the interacting systems, interacting or, or merging galaxies. And these are two spirals that do not present any signature of uh, merging activity. This is how they look like. So in color is the CO2 to one, and in pink is the continuum contours uh, with ALMA, uh, 1.3 millimeter. So you can see that the morphology are very different. And something that we found is that in the case of the interacting galaxy, uh, the central kiloparsec uh, contains uh, more molecular gas. So the molecular gas is more centrally concentrated in the interacting galaxy than in the spirals, no? that contain a significant amount of uh, molecular gas in the spiral arms. So this is one difference. But then, apart from the morphology that we can observe with ALMA because of the higher angular resolution, what we were more interested in was in the study in the kinematics, no? because this is the, the, like the, uh, the, the difference that, uh, that we can make here, studying the kinematics with very um, with good angular resolution. No? Our resolution is uh, 300, 400 uh, parses. Um, so then uh, we, we used uh, this uh, position velocity diagrams to interpret the kinematics because at the beginning, something that we were very puzzled about is that we did not detect uh, high velocity wings in the, in the CO emission lines. When you have, uh, like for example, very powerful units that have very powerful outflows, you see the, the broad wings, and then from that it's very easy to measure the outflow mass that it's carrying. But in the case of this galaxy, we didn't see any high velocity wings. So then interpreting the kinematics is uh, quite a challenge. So you have to um, model the, uh, the kinematics with a rotating model, subtract this model, and study the deviations from rotation and interpret whether they are inflow, outflow, et cetera. So this took a long time during the pandemic. Uh, but we, we managed to, um, to identify no, the, the, the different uh, regions of the, of the kinematics. And here, for example, this is the case of the TCAP, a uh, very well-known uh, quasar 2 uh, that has a, a jet in the innermost uh, region. And we see outflow uh, signatures uh, at mild velocity, I would say, of 200 uh, kilometers per second. And in general, this was uh, what we found for, for these uh, quasars. We found that the, the molecular outflow property that we were expecting to be very massive outflow because of the AGN luminosity that this uh, quasar have. They were um, sort of intermediate, intermediate, sorry, between the properties of this outflow in Cipher galaxy, so in lower luminosity AGN, 
and those in in the major in the in Julius or at least in the in the well studied uh, Julius. So plotting the quasars in this uh, uh, in this diagram that I was referring to before, no, from Fiore, that is the mass outflow rate versus the AGM luminosity. On, for the volumetric luminosity of our quasars, which are around here, we were expecting to measure outflow rates of 100 uh, solar masses per year at least. And instead, we are finding uh, things that are more of the order of 10 solar masses per year. So we were a bit puzzled at the beginning because it wasn't what we were expecting. But what we believe that what is happening, uh, well, it's partly a combination of things. One is that in the case of Fiore, they took like the most um, favorable assumptions to have like a high mass outflow rates. No, they assume uh, maximum velocity for the outflow, a uh, small outflow radius. So all these things put the outflow rates uh, up in this uh, in this diagram. No, so this is part of the of the reason. But another reason is because uh, I think when when Fiore published his, his uh, paper, they took well known AGN. Uh, for which they knew at the beginning that they already had outflow. So it was, I mean, they were more likely to have powerful outflow than more boring AGN, if you want, no? Uh, so this is like the, I think it's the upper envelope of this uh, relation, mm -hmm. no? And they claim that the higher the, the yield luminosity, the higher the mass of flow rate. Uh, but I think this is an oversimplification of the problem. And uh, other things like, for example, how it's uh, the coupling between the, the jets or the ionized winds with the molecular gas disk can be factors that we should take into account uh, to, to understand uh, why in some cases we have more and less massive molecular outflows. So depending on this, um, on, on how is the orientation of these uh, jets or ionized winds with the CO disks, then we will have more or less uh, massive uh, molecular outflows and other things uh, can be at play, like the, the Eddington ratio. Mm -hmm. So we need better statistics to understand um, why, in some cases, we have a very powerful outflows. Uh, but it's uh, it, it's likely that it's not only uh, the AGN luminosity, what what uh, the, like the main factor for driving molecular outflows, and the other things that I men I mentioned uh, should be taken into account. An example of this, and I finish with this, is uh, the TCAP galaxy, the quasar that I have mentioned that was studied by Annelise Audibert, another uh, researcher in my group. Uh, we published a, a press release uh, on Tuesday, actually, on this source. It's a letter that we have accepted in a &A, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so, and we studied this uh, object because it's a good example of this coupling between the YET and the ISM. Uh, this galaxy has a compact jet of one kiloparsec per rate um, in size, more or less, and it's um, almost coplanar uh, with the molecular gas disk. It subtends only a small angle relative to the molecular disk. We know that. Uh, so then it's a, an, a case in which we expect no, the, the jet to be dragging uh, molecular gas uh, outwards and producing a more massive uh, molecular outflow. So and least, uh, this is something that... Um, uh, for the people who study the simula uh, those uh, simulations of how jets entrain uh, the gas uh, in galaxy, uh, it, it, it has been known for some time now that even low power uh, jets, like this, the one in the TCAP that has a jet power of 10 to the 43 hertz per second, this is a low power jet, uh, sometimes they can create more damage in the galaxy than more powerful jets, because the more powerful jets just like uh, go through the galaxy ISM very quickly and they, they do a limited harm. But in the case of the low power jets, because they found more resistance uh, on the way, you know, because they are not so fast, uh, they, they create these bubbles uh, around them and uh, introduce more turbulence in the ISM. No? This is very interesting. So we believe that this, uh, this is a case like that. And actually, Annelise uh, found that in the direction perpendicular to the jet, there is enhanced uh, velocity dispersion, something that was already found in the ionized gas phase by Giacomo Venturi, for example, for a few AGN. But also, she found uh, higher uh, gas temperature, molecular gas temperature. So the jet, the, the action of the jet, is uh, heating uh, the molecular gas uh, on the in the direction perpendicular to the jet. And this is a bit uh, contraintuitive, no? Because in principle, we would expect it to to find it. In the along the jet, jet path, sorry, 
but we perform uh, tailored simulations uh, of, of the case of the of the TCAP. This is the observations, and this is a simulation. And actually, they reproduce that the velocity dispersion and also the, the gas temperature can be increasing in different directions, including the perpendicular one. And this is because of these bubbles that the jet creates. No? As the jet develops, uh, it, it creates these uh, bubbles that shock and, and push the surrounding gas. And then you sometimes you find uh, even a higher impact on the perpendicular direction to the jet than uh, along the jet. No? So, uh, so I'm going to finish uh, here. Just by saying that I hope I managed to convince you that, okay, it's difficult to find uh, evidence for AGN feedback on global galaxy scale. But when we look at the center of galaxy, we do see that a lot uh, is going on. And this is probably enough when we accumulate different AGN phases to eventually quench uh, galaxies. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina. So now we have some questions. Yes, welcome. Um, uh, thank you for the um, I was impressed because of all the data you have and the amazing results that we're gonna obtain and you're obtaining with the data. I was also surprising with uh, the results that uh, with some uh, agents you found that the multi-phase outflow is no longer that multi-phase outflow because mm -hmm. you take that in some wavelengths. So I was wondering if maybe the EM um, could be the case that only the energy of the EM can impact in some part of the phase of the outflow, and then we have like a chain effect where all the components such as the stereo positions that we have at some point in the outflow, in the molecular outflow pushing, the, that, that gas can also affect and create a different outflows. Mm -hmm. So at which uh, point can we determine the, the real influence of the EM in the dynamical and kinematical mass of the outro that we are measuring. You mean, so I understand what you say, no? and I think it's true. I think some, actually we see it on the, on the very small scale, no? that a, a nuclear outflow can impact another region of the galaxy and launch a more massive outflow because there is more material then there to be, to be launched. Uh, but I didn't understand how we measure, so the last part, how will we measure? When uh, the, the plot that you saw us from the volumetric luminosity from the mm -hmm. union of the gas, it's paying the volumetric luminosity from the union and the outflows. This deviation that we found, I would, um, for instance, if we take a look at the if they present multi phase outflows or not, mm -hmm. if the star populations that we can, let's say, uh, feed for these galaxies are younger, so they are also contributing to the outflow because of winds that we expect a strong winds that we expect from these populations. Can also these uh, scenarios explain also the deviation, not only... Um... It could be. We are exploring, I mean, we, we are focusing more on the AGM property, not in the... Because you mean a supernova driven yeah. winds and things like that. Yeah, this is like a, it could be, no, but uh, this is something that we are not considering at the moment. But this is why we need to enlarge. So what I have presented here is like the preliminary result, no, for uh, for um, not so many objects in the sample. But when we have like the the whole statistics, no, for the for the whole sample, then we will be able to learn more about this, no, because we want to see how are the stellar populations of the host galaxy. This is something that Patricia is doing. So we will be able to know how much uh, of young stellar population we have in the galaxy. So, and with all the information, we'll be able to, to better characterize that. Mm. Okay. Congratulations. This is really a beautiful work that you are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, well, uh, I have two curiosity and also uh, some concern. <laughs> Okay, I will start with the concern, uh, which is related because I didn't understand uh, exactly how do you estimate the the ages of the stellar population in the if you see the question, I understand, and you fit. We divided, so we, we fit the, the um, so she used satellite with the whole, with all the models, and then she, she just considered um, ages less than 100 mega years, between 100 and 2 giga years, and more than 2 giga years. 
and then we we um, we see how the percentage of each contributing to the total flux. If you know what I mean. But this is in, in a quasar. In a quasar. In in the quasar, yeah. So have you subtracted previously the quasar contribution? She took into account the nebular continuum, like she did the fit of yeah. the oxygen three lines, she subtracted the nebular continuum, yeah, and then she did the stellar population analysis. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. She, she yeah. but it's a woman PhD student of Clark Hunter, so they, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, Yes, yes, it can be up to, I think she measured up to 15% or something like that in this particular one. In any case, I found very difficult to distinguish between um, one, two, or three uh, million years stellar population. So you can put this on the limit in the ages, but uh, certainly to distinguish between one or two or three is really difficult. Yes, but in this case, we were just interested in knowing if there was something younger than 100 mega years. Mm -hmm. And the, in the, my curiosity was related with the galaxy. And you see um, 2,110, mm -hmm. that you saw the result. This is a, a really very complicated analysis. Yes. What I remember from more than 20 years ago that I did the, the ICU, like, ICU study of the galaxy is that there is also um, the, geo, the kinematic center of the galaxy is not coincident with the luminosity uh, center of the galaxy. Mm -hmm. But you say that the, the outflow don't make any impact on the, um, except in a scale of a few percent. So could be some way connected with this mismatch between the kinematic uh, center mm -hmm. and the, the luminosity center of this galaxy, the- I don't know about but... this outflow. No, but in this one, I said the opposite. So this is in this is an example in which we see, you know, that there is this was a some a study done by David Rosario. I'm not even part of this study, but uh, they found that there is uh, also this um, region in the center that is depleted of uh, molecular gas. So they interpret it as uh, the the action of the AGN fever that is removing the gas or heating it and um, be present in another transition. I think they said. So well, no and I don't I, I I don't know which uh, center they they consider I don't know but because yeah I put it just as an, an example of um, sorry I, I too many things well, because it's my fault <laughs> that like I would try to find more detail about this um, uh, the possible aspect of this outflow mm -hmm. in the central part of the galaxy and it could be connected. In this mismatch between the the kinematic center and the luminosity mm -hmm. center of the gas, mm -hmm. and the other one was because you passed the slide just for Marcaria for selecting. Yes, okay. <laughs> I put too many things. That's a shame. So yeah. just in case that you want to explain the result. Yes, this this is a very nice. I, I'd like to do it very quickly. So this is a galaxy that is super interesting because it was studied uh, with one of the quasars and it's very nearby. And it was studied by um, uh, Heckman and Rosa actually in the in the late 90s using uh, spectra from HST in the ultraviolet, optical, and also near infrared from the ground. And uh, by doing the analysis of the stellar populations, they found that there is a compact starburst in the center, a, a quite massive starburst, in this uh, region of the galaxy, here. So we wanted, uh, I, we thought, oh, this could be a fantastic case to study it in the mid infrared and see we found a pH emission, which are these lines that are associated with the, with young stars, with O and B stars. 
uh, in the nucleus of the galaxy because the, the size of the canary cam slit and the resolution, as you can see there, the green is the, is the canary cam slit. Canary cam is the mid infrared instrument that was on the GPC, but it's not there anymore, unfortunately. Uh, so we were looking for this uh, pH feature to see evidence of this starburst that we knew that it was in the nucleus, thanks to uh, Heckman and, and Rosa. And uh, surprisingly, we didn't find any evidence for the pH uh, features, not even at 11.3 microns, which are the pH features that are in principle more resilient to the, to the AGN radiation. Uh, so they, they are not there. And we know that the, the starburst is uh, happening. So there are O and B stars that should be producing this feature. So then uh, the most uh, likely explanation is that, that the AGN radiation is uh, destroying the, the pH. And this is very important to take, be taken into account for James Webb studies, because a lot of people will, for example, will target their AGN no, and not finding any pH feature at all. And they will say, oh, there is no pH emission because the AGN feedback has been has quenched star formation and there is no star formation. No? And this is an example that no, the AGN is having an influence on the pH feature because it destroys the molecules, but not because there is no star formation. There is a star formation, we know that. No? So it's uh, something to, to take into account. Hmm. Thank you, Ross. <laughs> there is a question in Zoom by Ismael Garcia Bernetti. Yeah. Hi, Cristina. Thank you for this very nice talk. So I was wondering just about the plot that you have for the comparison with Fiore for the outflow. Yeah. So I find this super interesting. I saw this in a previous talk of uh, that you give. So this is, uh, what is the conversion factor that we are using for the CO here? Is the same thing that Fiore was using? Because I just was wondering if the conversion factor can take account a bit of this no, it wasn't the same because we went. We wanted to, so we 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 did the same uh, thing. Also, we we applied the same factor for the alpha geometry. I think we divided everything by three because we wanted them to be as our quasars. And for the molecular gas conversion, I think they were using zero point eight for the alpha CO, and we we used the same. Yes. Okay. Okay. Mm. So no, it's it's not that, but it's. Uh, all the other things that I mentioned, no, it can be the coupling yeah. and, and also the, the fact that they assume, I think, an outflow radius of one kiloparsec, which is small, and uh, also the, the maximum velocity. No? If you use the maximum velocity, then your outflow rate goes up. Mm. And it would be very nice anyway to see this with the James Webb, no? with the warm molecular phase you know, that is less affected by the excitation and so on. No? Yes. Although I think we are tracing much less mass, no, with the, but it will be interesting to see. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the talk, Christina. Thanks for the talk. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a question about this plot. And I agree with you that there is some fine tuning in the works, uh, in the work of Fioretta, but mm -hmm. it was nice to see different kinds of data, different kinds of outflow, finally treated homogeneously because everyone has a different uh, definition of velocity and whatever. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, it's, it's a good work that could be actually uh, improved. And for your result, I was wondering, because we find this trend uh, with the outflow mass rate, but do you find some difference also when you take into account the energy? Because the common thing is that the mass, uh, the alpha mass, is higher in molecular gas, lower in the ionized gas, mm -hmm. and with energy is the other way around. So I was thinking, I was, I was, yeah, thinking, wondering if you find this uh, same kind of behavior uh, um, yeah, taking into account the energy. The energy. Yeah. If, if this is true for the mass, it could be true also for the energy. It, yeah, and, and it is. It is because, it is. Yes, also because I think partly because the so the energy goes with the square of the velocity. So again, no, if you have a much higher velocity, then the energy is going to be higher. So, but uh, stay tuned for this because Anneliese Divert is now like looking at uh, considering different outflow scenarios for this uh, galaxy, and for example for the Tika. She uh, like she she tried like from the most conservative to less conservative, and uh, for example here I measure I think 15 solar masses per year for this galaxy, 
and she found that the range is actually more like between 10 and 40. So, I mean, still we are not in the Fiore, no, because we are not more than 100, but uh, I mean, there is, uh, it shows you also no, the range of uncertainty that we have only by considering more or less mass or measuring the outflow mass in a different way. No, yeah. no mention of the mass and energy. Hmm? It's mass, mass and energy, energy yeah. And we, are, we are looking at that and like trying to compute these ranges. No? So we'll see how it compares. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Mm, Maya's last question. Last question. Thank you very much for this nice talk. Mm -hmm. I guess I don't then do many things. That's why it's one of my fellows expert, expertise. I used to work in protoplanetarities and yet. Mm -hmm. And I had a question regarding the first part of this talk regarding the dust detected mm -hmm. in the polar radiation. Mm -hmm. Is it detected with ALMA? And are you sure this does? Or it could be contamination for the lines? Because careful with this issue, because it could be more than yes, yes. the emissions. So, uh -huh. the same effect. so, in the case of the molecular gas, like <coughs> I said, the Majority it's in the equatorial plane. So we, so these huge uh, polar components that we observe in the mid infrared, we do not observe them with ALMA. We only observe sometimes like the, the base of the of the wing. No? So if there is a polar outflow, then there is like an X-shaped uh, structure that is visible in, in molecular gas. No, uh, We are talking about, here I'm talking about the, the uh, kilopars, like parsecs, tens of parsec scale, uh, uh, polar dust, no? So the thing that we can observe, or even more, even kiloparsec, that we can observe from the ground and with James Webb, no? Because then there is the mid infrared interferometry results that are like central parsecs, no? So, um, an emission line contamination, uh, it could be because actually when you, so these polar outflows are normally in the direction of the narrow line region where we see the ionization cones that we see in oxygen-3. Mm -hmm. So uh, actually one of the goals of this uh, James Webb proposal no, where, where it was to, to constrain if we are really measuring like uh, dusty outflows or just dust that is sitting in the narrow region together with the line emitting gas, mm -hmm. which could be a possibility. No? So whether it's uh, something static, no? static uh, like rotating, no? like the narrow region, or something that is really outflowing and carrying uh, dust, no? And we will know that, for example, measuring the uh, dust composition, no? We can, they are trying to reproduce the, the James Webb results with models, no? To see if it contains graphites or silicates or, no? These things that can allow us to constrain also whether the dust comes from the nuclear region or if that, that is are larger scales. Yeah. Mm. Great, no? Yes, yes. In yes. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Okay, so just, just before before thanking Christine again, I, I remind you that we are going to have lunch or something similar to lunch nearby. So uh, I invite you, especially young researchers, as I told in my email, to come with us and continue the formal uh, discussion, the informal discussion, <laughs> informal discussion with Christina. So thank you again. Thank you. And so